In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning, everyone. So this is going to be a little bit of a show-and-tell sermon. If you recall, back in September of 2022, His Grace Bishop Sebastian visited us and uh, spent the weekend with us, and among other things, he bestowed upon me the very high honor of Proto-Presbyter of the Ecumenical Throne. And this is the highest honor that a married clergyman can receive. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but during that service, whether you were here live or saw it on live stream, I know at least one person did, I had no emotion, no expression. And uh, this one man texted me and said, Father, you've got to work on your expression of surprise. <laughs> well, let me tell you, I know my strengths, and I know my weaknesses, and I know what I'm worthy of. If this was a, uh, you know, Mr. Congeniality Award, fine, I could, I could get it. But this officion, this status, of proto-presbyter to the ecumenical throne did not align with my portrait of myself. Now, lest you think this has anything to do with humility, I assure you it does not. Not even false humility, because there are awards that I have received over the years that I did feel that I was worthy of, and I'm about to crow about them for the next five minutes. So first is kind of a light and frivolous one, just to have a light mood because what's coming is not so light. So the first one is when I was in Goya. This was back in Buffalo, New York. My first three years of Goya were sort of unspectacular. We had a basketball team. <clears throat> I was not good. I sat the bench. I was a liability to the team. And so they only put me in just to say, okay, Christy, five minutes and you're out. Okay, okay, fine. But when I, in my last year, in my senior year, some transformation took over me. We went to a tournament, I remember, in Binghamton, New York. It was called the Tri-City Tournament. And I became, in that tournament, Michael Jordan. I have no idea what happened to me. I was leaping tall buildings with a single bound, blocking shots left and right, scoring, hitting the winning shot, knocking out the home team out of the tournament. Cheerleaders were going crazy, calling my name. And uh, I mean, I could go on and on, but I'm too modest. I don't want to tell you these things. <laughs> so uh, that night, there was an awards banquet. And I knew... I was going to get an award. I mean, it was obvious that I, I played unbelievably, uncharacteristically. And so, sure enough, <laughs> thank you. You're making me relive, relive my, uh, okay, 1970 Goya All Star. So, uh, you know, Presbyteta was cleaning the house uh, a while back, and she considered this clutter, and she was going to throw it out. And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> so that was one award I felt that I was worthy of. The second award was when I was in Memphis, Tennessee, serving the Annunciation Greek Orthodox Church. And we were hosting the Clergy Laity Conference. Not only Metropolitan Nicholas of Detroit, because we were in the Detroit metropolis, not only he showed up, but also Archbishop Demetrius of America came as well. He is the predecessor to Archbishop of Elpidophoros. And we showed them a great time. Just like we did here in 2017, we did the clergy laity here in Raleigh. A plus, great job by the community. Back then, same thing. And my fingerprints were all over that 
particular clergy laity back in Memphis. Memphis is a great little town. It's got a nice character and vibe to it. Many landmarks. We have uh, St. Jude's Children's Hospital. I took the archbishop there, saw a patient. My goodness, can you imagine being a patient in a hospital and the Archbishop of America walks in? Um, uh, I took him to Lorraine Hotel. I took them to barbecue, the world-famous barbecue, Rondé Ribs. I, everything was uh, A-plus again. But when we went to the Lorraine Hotel, this is where Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. They turned that into a uh, civil rights museum. They still have the room and the balcony where Dr. King was when he stood out on that balcony and got assassinated. Um, I had a good relationship with the Civil Rights Museum and I got a copy of the 1968 or something like this uh, Look magazine, I, had, I think it's right there, show and tell, uh, of Archbishop Jacobus walking with uh, Martin Luther King in Selma, Alabama. It was on the front page of Look Magazine, and I asked them, could you please display this for the, the, all the people that are coming to visit this museum? And they said, yes, of course. And so they put it up, Archbishop Demetrius Metropolitan Nicholas, my brother priest, the delegates from all over Detroit Metropolis, they saw this in the museum, and it was a beautiful moment. Not only that, but I happened to be friends with a friend of Dr. Martin Luther King. His name was Reverend Billy Kyles. And I asked him, Billy Kyles was at the bottom of the balcony when, when uh, Dr. King got assassinated. He was waiting for Dr. King to come down and have dinner at his house. We ourselves, Presbyteria and I and our kids, hosted Reverend Billy Kyles in our home. It was like touching history. It was amazing. So I asked Reverend Billy Kyles, could you please give us a private tour of the Civil Rights Museum? Of course, Father. And he did. Beautiful. Next, another landmark. I was in the car. The two hierarchs were in the back seat. And I said, um, I turned around and I said, Your Eminence, would you like to go to Graceland? Now, <laughs> Metropolitan Nicholas did not think that was a good idea, so he kind of backed up and he said like this. <laughs> I hope nobody shows this to this, but anyway. Um, but thank God, Archbishop uh, Demetrius said, yes, I'd love to. Did you know that Graceland, the home of Elvis, is the second most visited house in America, next to the White House? And so we went. But not only that, Elvis's doctor was a parishioner of ours in Memphis, Dr. George Nicopolis. And so I went to Dr. George. I said, Doctor, can you give us a private tour of Graceland? And he did. And he sat and answered questions back and forth. And it was amazing. It was just an amazing experience. Um, so after all this, the banquet was a was absolutely fabulous, and after all that, Metropolitan Nicholas had no choice but to give me the officium of economos. And when you give that officium, that status of economos, you get this, this uh, vestment. It's called the epigonation, upon the knee, epigonation. Unless you become an economos, you cannot wear this epigonation. So, let me give you the etymology of this word, econ economos. The ancient Greek word for house is ikos, ikos. Economos is the manager of the house. And so that, what, that is what was bestowed on me, and it is from this status, my friends, of economos that I wish to address you today. All that to say what I'm about to say. Ah, uh, thank you. <laughs> this guy is Ed McMahon, if I, and I'm Johnny Carson. Okay. You know, tonight is the official kickoff of the capital campaign for the new master plan. 
as economos, one could legitimately ask me, because I have this status as manager of the house, manager of the funds, Father, in your judgment, can we afford the master plan? It almost feels like we are trying to feed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish, Father. Well, yes, from a business perspective, from a business model with budgets and finances and spreadsheets, and yes, it looks like a David and Goliath situation. Indeed, Father, can we afford this master plan? Now, before answering that, as economos, I want to read to you what the prayer is over the candidate who is about to receive this ofikion. Bear with me. This is the prayer that Metropolitan Nicholas read over me 16 years ago. O Lord our God, who as master did praise the wise steward for his good management, do you also bless this your servant, Apostolos the priest, as economos, and strengthen and increase him that he may manage with faith and wisdom and in a way pleasing to you the things pertaining to the church and monies, that he may be accounted worthy of the joy received by the good and faithful servants of the talents, and, and get this, and escape the flight of shame and the judgment of the slothful and wicked servant who hid the talent in the earth. That's the prayer. Today is Judgment Sunday. My son, William, spoke to you last week, telling you about the uncommon goodness and mercy and compassion and forgiveness of our Lord. And that is all true. But it is also true that one day we will be, have to give an account of our works and have to give an account of our character. That last day, He is all compassionate, but he is also our judge. As your priest, as economos, and as proto-presbyter of the ecumenical council, if need be, I'm telling you today, the question is not whether we can afford to do it. It's whether we can afford not to do it. My job, my calling, is not to look at where we've been. It's not even to look at where we are. My job is to call out what we are becoming. I fear, my dear ones, that we are becoming fat and lazy. You may protest. Father, how can you say that? Our ministries are bustling, our attendance is wonderful, our budgets are healthy, our children are engaged. We're setting stewardship records year after year. This this past year, we blew it out of the water. All true. But it is also true that we are sitting on 12 acres of land, prime land. We're sitting on four and a half million dollars doing Nothing. Choking on our own fat. We are being content with facilities that are the same as they were 50 years ago. We are being complacent and untroubled by the fact that we have not kept up. We are becoming like that wicked servant who said to the Lord at his return, Lord, I hid my talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. You can't ask a father to be okay with that, especially a father who cares about the character of his child or a priest who cares about the soul of his community. My spiritual family, do not be content with the casual. Do not be content with the functional. When it comes to the church, you have to think of beauty. Beauty will save the world. Our very orthodoxy demands and asks of us to 
make beauty. Beauty is in our very theology. Whole nations have been captured by the beauty of orthodoxy. It is the fullness of time to make a statement. We will be engaging you in the next few months, each and every one of you, somehow, some way, neighborhood meetings, individual meetings, gatherings here at church, every one of you will be engaged and we will ask, we will ask, what can you do? Make a pledge, make a three-year pledge. What can you do? Make a one-time gift but do something. Let beauty cost you something. As Ekonomos said, I'll end with this. I believe two things. If we all participate, no excuses. Every individual, every family, every ministry, two things will happen. One, your giving will come up as a memorial to you before God. That's number one. Number two, if we all participate with unity of thought and one accord, only then will God provide the increase. He wants to see you participate. And then I believe he will provide the increase, what we need. Only then can we make history. God bless you today. Amen.